standing as we sing about his promises. Aren't you glad for God's promises this morning? Amen. As we sing, to God be the glory, we're reminded that today is his day, the day of salvation. We continue to worship him. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made. bow with me please father how wonderful it is that you're here to worship that we're here to worship you god not that you worship us but we worship you lord 
What a wonderful thought and a wonderful time of our life, God, to be in the midst of a holy God and a precious Savior, Jesus Christ, and a precious Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for another day that you blessed us with, Lord. Beautiful sunshine. Beautiful opportunity, God, to, to say that we're standing on your promises, God. We cannot fail when we stand on your promises. Oh, God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for what you have put us here for to worship. And I thank you, God, for all the many blessings. Your love and your mercy, God, and your everlasting grace. I'm so, God, so glad, God, that you, you called us to be one of yours, the very foundation of the world. Thank you, Father. And I'm so glad, God, that your mercy is renewed daily. Father, I pray this morning now for the ones of our congregation, God, that have problems, whatever they are, financial, spiritual, spiritual, physical. Oh, Lord, there's so many among us, God, that that's what you know all about our, our thoughts, about our frames, you know all about our problems in our lives, God. I don't have to stand and tell you that. You know all about us, God. Lord, thank you for, thank you for this, God. And Father, I pray this morning, Brother Durbin, I pray the Holy Spirit, God, would just speak out from his voice, God, and, and give us the words that we need to hear, Lord, that would praise you and bring honor and glory to your holy name. Thank you for the music that we just heard, God. I pray for the choir and the choir director. And I pray for the young people, God. And I pray, God, that you just continue to bless us with these young people. And Lord, for the visitors, I thank you for them this morning, God. I know there's some here. I've already met one couple. And I thank you for them, Lord. Now, God, it's your day. Lord, don't let me say anything that would, would bring dishonor or glory to your holy name. Don't let me say anything, God, that would bring reproach. And forgive us, Lord, where we fail you. In the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
Amen. As always, we're thankful for the choir. We need more members. Some are absent today. Some of you are taking a sabbatical. Would you consider joining the choir? Uh, Brother Mike would uh, give incentives for that. Seconds on ice cream when we have an ice cream social or something. Not sure. We'll figure something out. Thank you. Remember, everything we do in our worship is honoring Him. It's not honoring us. It's about Him, okay? And uh, I know you recognize that. Let me say thank you for being here. We have quite a few of you visiting with us today. We have a couple of special things going on, and that draws some of you. Others are here uh, to worship the Lord with us uh, as well. And we want to say thank you to all of you. We have a packet of information about the church and the ministry to describe some of what goes on here. We'd love for you to take a packet of this. Uh, fill out that yellow card. It's a visitor card. And that gives us some information about you as we send some information about us with you as you go home today. In church also, make your way to see somebody you don't know, and you say, well, I don't know what to tell them. Put your hand in theirs and tell them your name. Tell them you're glad they're here today. And uh, that's how we get to meet one another. Children, you can make your way to children's worship politely down the center aisle, not running, and that means as you go all the way, not running. Okay, please. Let's stand, church. Greet everyone around you as we continue in our worship. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Okay. If, if I get a little microphone there, I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment. I got carried away shaking a few hands. And uh, y'all come on up with us. Uh, I got carried away, and I had told uh, Ken and uh, Brittany to come on up during the welcome, and I wasn't around, so... Hey, last Sunday we had a unique service in the beginning of the service, or in this time of the, well, the beginning of the service last week, we uh, baptized and then we did a child dedication. Today we're doing a child dedication and we're going to baptize in the end of the service. And those are always special times. Now, it's always unique to do one or the other, but especially when you're doing that with the same families, it makes it especially unique. And today, uh, Kenneth and Brittany are dedicating Grayson K. Birch to the Lord. 
And uh, that, that is beautiful. And they got a whole group of people over here encouraging them. And I, I, I think y'all might, uh, might be thick there. I can already tell. They told me that I'd have to be straight with all those folks coming from Axon today. But anyway, we, hey, we've been blessed with uh, Kenneth and Brittany. And, uh, you know, as I was in their home the other, day, the other night, they told me how much a baby can change a life. Anybody agree to that? Man, it'll change your personal perspective. It'll change your eternal perspective. And because of that today, they want to dedicate Grayson to the Lord. And we know God loves the children. Hey, Grayson, how are you, buddy? <laughs> I was good with him the other night at the house until he wanted his bottle. But uh, we, we're all right. We, we thick together ourselves. Kenneth and Brittany, in the beginning, the Lord created male and female, and then Adam and Eve... Uh, uh, procreated and they brought into the world kids and God said that in sorrow you would bring forth a child and you've been through that you understand the sorrow of the pains of childbirth and now together y'all are raising him in the way that God wants him to go and there's no doubt in my mind having sit with y'all that that's your whole desire now is to raise grace into the ways of the Lord uh, the Bible says children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And he said to the dads, provoke not your children to wrath, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So today, as we come to dedicate him, I'm going to ask you, do you, Kenneth and Brittany, desire earnestly that Grayson shall grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Yes, sir. Do you covenant together to strive to bring him to a knowledge of the Scriptures, teaching loving, obedient reverence for God and his Son, Jesus Christ? Yes, we do. As you pledge yourself to the Lord to this end, I encourage you by using the agencies of the church and the family and friends to accomplish this purpose. And one of the blessings sitting with them is that they, uh, they, they love the ministry of what we do with the kids from way down early on. And, and church, you'll be a part of that all through the life of Grayson as he grows in his likeness of the Lord Jesus. Grandparents, any grandparents here? Amen. Y'all the proud ones, I know. My wife and I, we have the grandkids. We, we're blessed by that. We should have had them first, I know, but we didn't. Grandparents, let me encourage you as well. Curtis and Patricia Sellers, Johnny and Gail Birch, uh, you've heard the pledges that your kids make, and let me encourage you about supporting them prayerfully and in every way, as I know you will, to see this grandbaby be all that God wants him to be. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Lord, nothing more precious than the gift of a child and how, Lord, that gift of a child brings joy. But, Lord, sometimes even through life that child can bring sorrow. But yet, Lord, we know all in all that, Lord, you've given us a little piece of eternity when you entrust a child to us. Bless, Lord, Kenneth and Brittany and Grayson, and I pray that it will be a happy home, a healthy home. But, Lord, more so, we pray that it would even be a holy home throughout these years. God, as uh, they grow together, that, Lord, they'll exalt the Lord Jesus in every way of their lives. So we commit grace unto you, just like Hannah did Samuel when she had that little boy. And she said, Lord, you've only loaned him to me. So, Lord, we give him back to you. And we'll steward over him with the gospel. And we'll steward over him with the resources you entrust to us. And I know they will now in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a certificate of dedication. It might be something you want to hold on to. I don't know if you're one of them hoarders like some of us are. A beautiful little Bible. It's a soul winner's New Testament. If I'm around when he leads his first person to a knowledge of Jesus, I'd love to know that because that's what it's life's about. And I'm going to go ahead and present you with a baptismal certificate, and we will baptize you at the end of the service, okay? God bless you. Church, tell me you're praying for them, okay? God bless y'all. to lean on Jesus. And that's what we're going to sing, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's stand and sing together. A congregational hymn. What a fellowship. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning, Leaning on, on the everlasting arms. What a blessing is, what a peace is mine.
Would you remember in prayer some folks this morning? Betty Sowell went home to be with the Lord this morning. Uh, pray for her family. They meet with the, uh, with the funeral home at 2 o'clock, so I don't have any information to give you about her celebration service. Pray for Pat Miller. She's at Hospice House. She's awaiting her uh, heavenly introduction, and I know she's prepared and ready for that. Vidal Bennett, she's uh, in Jacksonville at Mayo. Herbert Bond is at home. Elon Galloway will be going for a procedure on Thursday. Betty Christmas, Benny Hires is uptown in the hospital. Willene Carter, Steve Hires is at Mayo in Jacksonville as well, getting a strong round of chemo treatment, and we saw him Friday night while we were down there. And best brother George Lloyd, and then we got Adolf Davis is down at St. Vincent's with some issues, uh, cardiac, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, without you, we'd have no hope. But because of you and your grace and mercy, we are people of hope today. Lord, you've heard the names and the needs. And Lord, none of it catches you by surprise, for you're the omniscient one. But, Lord, I just remind you today how totally dependent we are, I am, upon you. God, encourage me as I encourage others and others as they encourage others. Because, Lord, we all need one another. Bless now the tithe and the offering, the gifts as well as the givers. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Amen. If you couldn't understand that message, uh, maybe I can help you over the next few minutes. God sees a cross. God saw a cross. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kenny. You always do that with energy, and I appreciate uh, your faithfulness. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through verses 47. Now, those of you who have uh, been here for the last couple of weeks know that we're reading through a devotional book, uh, and there's some still available. It's uh, entitled Reach, R-E-A-C-H. The R, we spent uh, five, six devotions on the little letter of R, and we use that to make us remember about how that God wants us to go out and reclaim them that are either lost, that are backslidden, that are unfaithful. So that R stood for reclaim. The E last week we focused in devotions or on evangelism week before last, those devotions, uh, uh, and we saw people get saved because why? We talk about Jesus. Now this this week you were reading devotions that began with the letter A, and the word was, uh, or is, or were, was, assimilate. Now, I know some of you might say, well, hey, you know, I need a thesaurus to remember all of this. But anyway, to assimilate means to incorporate, absorb, or even take on board. Well, what do we do with people who become a part of the church? What do we do with people who visit the class? What do we do with people who come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus? So we somehow have to make room for them, and we have to intentionally be a part of allowing them to become a part of us. Well, that's what we want to focus on today. And you say, oh, preacher, we've had quite a few lately. Never have we had a, a setting like this church had when there were over 2,000 in one day. Look what they say they did. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify, notice, and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. In the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Look at it. 3,000. What are we going to do with so many? It said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together. They had all things common, and sold their possessions, goods, parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with, with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And look at the last sentence, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Saved. I see that not only had God added to the church that should be saved, but because they were handling this assimilation process faithfully, that God continued to add to the church uh, those uh, that should be saved. Well, as I, I thought on that, I, I found that in Acts 5.14, again it says, and believers were added to the Lord multitudes uh, of men and women. I found in Acts 11.24 it said, for he for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost of faith and much people were added to the Lord. Notice two times it talks about much added to the Lord. Acts 6, 1 it says that it wasn't an addition it was a multiplication. It said there was murmuring in the days when the disciples were multiplied. The church is growing exponentially and because of that we got to do something with them the Lord tells us. 
And then one more time in Acts 6, 7, it said the word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient unto the faith. There's four quick things I want to share with you today in this passage. I want you to see it with me. How do we handle those uh, people who come to know Jesus? How do we handle those people who are inquisitive to know about Jesus? Did you know there are people who are inquisitive about the church? Church. They did not grow up in a church. They don't understand church language. They don't have a glossary with them to look it up. They don't have a thesaurus when we use those large words. So how do we share with them uh, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done as well as what Jesus desires? I can tell you that there are people sitting beside you sometimes on a church pew who may lean over to you and ask a question about, hey, how do I understand what the church is about? I had a lady come to me at the end of the service the other day, uh, and she told me that someone had asked her a question similar to that. A few weeks ago, I had somebody tell me I need to be baptized. Uh, listen, folks, people are talking. They are wanting information. So when I begin to think about assimilate, first of all, let's go all the way back to the beginning and see what the early church did. First of all, there's information that is needed. How to become a part uh, of the family. If you'll allow me, let me read those two verses to you again. It said, now when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You say, preacher, what had they heard? Can I tell you what they had heard? Peter, on that day of Pe at Pentecost, uh, the 50th day after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, Pentecost means 50. So at that Pentecost celebration that day, everybody in Jerusalem heard the gospel message in their native tongue spoken by men that had not learned learned the language, uh, the miracle was that those men were able to speak a language they had never uh, even trained themselves for, and everybody heard the gospel in their own language. And the scripture said, now when they had heard this, not when they had heard those men speak in a tongue that they did not learn, when they had heard all of that talk about Jesus. You know what Peter did? Peter just stood up and lifted up Jesus. Amen. People, let me tell you something today. I sense a yearning. I sense a, 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 a revival that could take place uh, or in, in the circles that I'm going. I'm serious because I'm finding that there are people who are inquisitive about this thing called church or salvation, and there is a readiness, I believe, uh, to, to know the Prince of Peace. Why? Because everything we find in the news and read in the paper today is doom and gloom, but people won't hope. Amen. And they said, what shall we do? I, I, I find in this passage that because they had given the information, that Peter then could expand on that information and say unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in His permanence. So real quickly right there, I think there's four things. First of all, there's a the conviction of the Spirit. Man can't produce that. I can't produce that. Uh, I'm not eloquent enough. Hey, I'm not manipulative enough to make you feel sorry for your sin. Because if I make you feel sorry for your sin, somebody else is going to make you feel good about your sin. So we're going to leave that to the Spirit. Amen? Amen. And they were pricked in their heart. You know, most of us, we don't have to be told that we've sinned, do we? But brother, I'll tell you, when something wakes us up in the middle of the night or shakes us off a church pew or maybe nudges us in the, while traveling down the road in our vocation, something nudges us and, hey, that's a conviction of the Spirit. Let me go ahead and tell you. Consideration of the what? Well, consideration of the person. What are they doing? They having to consider, what is this going on in me? So they consider that. But then there's confession of their sin. What does Peter say? He said, repent. Now, he doesn't use the word confess there, but he said, repent. But I do know that with confession should always include repentance, right? So many times we have people who want to confess, but they want to get back out and go and do the same thing again. That's not repentance. 
Repentance means that I've admitted where I missed that mark, where I sinned against God, and I'm going to go out, and I'm not going to do that again. That's what we find when Jesus met that woman that day. The guys had brought to him in adultery. He said, go and sin no more. There was confession of the sin, but then there was a confirmation of the soul, and we're going to explore that in just a moment, but that confirmation says that uh, repent and be baptized. So I don't want to mess you up on that one yet. In Acts 2.39, the Scripture said, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Boy, I'm glad God's still got a promise of that. Amen? Amen. Hey, God's still calling. You know what? Ephesians 1.4 said God loved us from the foundation of the earth. Amen. Ephesians 1.13 said we can be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And right in the very middle of that, it's just full of Jesus everywhere. When it talks about at the cross, he paid our sin debt. Friend, hey, there must be information, right? Sunday school teacher, don't assume that when you're teaching a class on a Sunday morning that everybody knows the language. Take time to explain the truth of the gospel. Not only is there information, but, you know, I'm discovering that in this passage in the early church, the first century church, they did not have newspapers, they did not have telephones, uh, uh, they had camel rides and they had uh, walk talks, did a chalk talk. So, man, how do we get all this information out? Well, notice the people at Pentecost that day that were 3,000 of them, they're going to leave Jerusalem, and then they're going to carry this information out. But in the meantime, if we're going to assimilate these people in the body, what do we do? There's got to be identification. I was reading a lengthy paragraph on this the other day, and that's not in your notes because of lack of a, uh, enough space there. But it, it was just a, a, a notation on baptism and, I, uh, and, and how it is a sign of identification. And I'm just going to go back to the life of Jesus and tell you that baptism is a sign of identification. The Scripture tells us that John was baptizing in the Jordan River one day, John the Baptist that is, and it said that as John the Baptist was baptizing that Jesus comes up to the bank that day and tells John, John, I, I need you to baptize me. And John said, hey, I'm not worthy. John said, hey, I don't even need to, uh, to take your sandals off, man. You need to be baptizing me. John knew his cousin well. Jesus didn't need to be baptized to have a confirmation. Somebody said, well, why was Jesus baptized? I think it was for identification. He identified with John in the gospel message that he was preaching. And Jesus went down and he came up, brother. Why? Because he identified with us even in that, didn't he? So as we think about that real quickly, it said, They that gladly received the word were, what's the word? Baptized, were they not? Let me just go ahead and tell you, baptism is not going to save you. There might be somebody here that believes that. It's not going to save you. If that's the case, I got a swimming pool in the backyard, got a brand new liner in it at the cost of about $4,000, and I'd be baptizing Waycross. You know what that water do to him? Make them wet. But to a believer, to somebody who's invited Jesus into their heart, claimed him as Lord of their life, to me it's a picture of salvation. In a moment, I'm going to take Brittany in the baptismal pool, and Brittany's going to be standing there, and I said this last Sunday with the others, and, and, and Brittany's a picture of a life without Jesus. Brittany tells me the other night when I were in their home that, that she, believed in, if she believes in Jesus, and she confessed her sin to Jesus and her faith in Jesus, and I'm going to bury her. She died. No, she didn't, preacher. She's breathing. She died to herself. Amen. I'm going to raise her up. I'm not going to leave her down there. Her husband needs her. Her son needs her. But I'll tell you what, she's going to be more valuable to them because she's got Jesus in her life. Amen. Boy, it's a picture of salvation, death, burial, and resurrection. But it also is identification with the church, isn't it? You know, we as, as Southern Baptists, we as Baptists, we as Second Baptists, if you want to get technical about it, somebody says, what have I got to do to be a member? You've got to be saved. Well, preach what about them that don't act like they're saved? Well, Y'all got to deal with them. Such were some of you. But hey, you've got to be saved. Hey, there's only one requirement that we have, and that's scriptural baptism. We believe by immersion. Oh, preacher, I get hung up on that. Why don't we just do it all sorts of ways? Well, it's just a scriptural way. That's what Jesus did. 
But that's what it means, you identify with us. Now, I don't have a lot in common with all of you. Yes, I do. I put my shoes on. I pull my socks up. I tighten my belt up. Well, I loosen my belt up here lately, you could tell. But anyway, one thing we know, we have confessed our sin to Jesus. We have confessed our faith in Jesus. And we're baptized as believers together. We identify with one another. Preacher, that's too simple. Well, you've got to talk simplicity with the Lord because He's the one that gave us the Word. I'm just telling you, how do we assimilate people in the body? There's some of you have been worshiping with us from time to time. You've been regular. You're more faithful than some of our members. And I say that without any grudges whatsoever. You probably want to ask some questions. Well, let me tell you something. Information. I've committed every Sunday morning in June. I'm going to do a sanctuary Bible class at 945. Oh, man, we do an orchestra in there. We, well, y'all going to get through earlier. I'm going to do it right over there on that side. I'm going to get my little podium right down there, and I'm going to take four weeks at least to give information about Jesus and the church and stuff like that, okay? But don't wait for that. Let me go ahead and tell you before. But anyway, identification. Some of you have identified, but you still need more information. But there's a third point in this that I'm seeing. Not only I, uh, uh, information and identification, there's instruction, learning with the family. Now, I know June's not a good time to be learning. School's out, somebody said. I thought when I got 18, I got out of school and I got that little diploma. I thought I'd learned all there was to know that I needed to know. Brother, I tell you what, I, I didn't know nothing. Then I thought, man, I've been in Sunday school for 18 years. My mama carried me before she let me out, and she carried me, and I know, I know enough. Man, when I was 25 years old, God had called me to pastor a church. I thought, man, I don't know nothing. I pastored a church for 34 years. You want me to tell you what I know now? I don't know much at all. Because culturally, everything is changing. Socially, everything has changed. But the one thing I still know is there's a constant in our society, and it's Jesus. Amen. You say, preacher, I, I just can't, I can't get along. I, I can't hold on with the pace of life. Hey, just hold on to Jesus. He hasn't moved. So we'll deal with instruction. They continued. Notice what? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. I do believe that these 3,000 in that church that had got saved that day, I believe they made a place in their schedule to be faithful among the brethren. Oh, preacher, I tell you, getting there at Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, that's about all we can do. I, well, I don't know how much more time we got. Brother, if, you, if, if you're going to be as faithful to God as He is to you, remember, God gave you 168 hours this week. You said, but I can't be there 10 hours a week. I've not asked you to be. But you know what? They made a priority to get instructed. And the early church made a priority on instructing the believers. And when I thought on that instruction, there's some things came to my mind. And I went back to Matthew, and I know that script is real small, but I needed to say it because most of you got your Bibles anyway. Those of you who don't have them, you got to memorize, so I know that. But the scripture said, And Jesus went about the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So notice the pattern of Jesus. Jesus didn't just call people to him, did he? He was out there going amongst them. Boy, he'd go to this little town, this little city, this little village. And what is he doing? He's going in the synagogue. And he's teaching them, giving instruction. Somebody told me one day, said, Hey, man, your, your preaching style has changed after about 15 years. I, I took that offensively, and I thought, Oh, I went home, I was sulking. I quit spitting down the second row, and I quit hooting and hollering. And they said, Boy, you're becoming more, fo you, you're becoming more focused on teaching. Well, brother, I think that's what people need. They know, they know how we can talk. They need to know how we walk and how we're to walk. So, hey, Jesus went about. Not only that, look at the principles of Jesus. He went about, it said, teaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Friend, let me tell you something. There is no other gospel. There may be other ways. 
the Pharisees said, we've got a way. The Sadducees said, we've got a way. The Essenes of John the Baptist even, uh, back down on the Sea of, Gal uh, sea of uh, the Dead Sea, they had a way. But you know what? Only Jesus is the true way. Amen. So he's teaching the gospel of the kingdom. You notice the passion of Jesus. He would move with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd. You know, well, that's what's happening in our world today, isn't it? Everybody's grasping for a little bit of this and a little bit of that and some of this and some of that. And in the meantime, it almost, it almost resembles a tail wagging a head on the dog because people need not only information and identification. Man, we're needing instruction Hey, the guys who have been in church all of their lives and have studied church life far greater than I have are realizing that, hey, we're probably bringing more people in the front door and before we can get them instructed and assimilated, they've gone out the back door. And how is it that a church can baptize three or 400 people in four years and their attendance stay the same? Y'all trying to figure that out too, aren't you? Brother, we've missed a mark. And that mark might be that we're not instructing them. I'm not saying we're guilty, but I'm saying, boy, that's a part of it, isn't it? Hey, you're here. You're a new member. You're a prospective member. You're a wannabe. Let me tell you something. I've got an investment that I want to give to you. I want to give you information. I likewise want to help you understand the fact of identifying with the body of Christ and giving you instruction that's learning within the family. There's a passage in Acts chapter 18, verse 24 to 38. It's not in your notes, and I don't have time to read that lengthy passage, but it is a place that it said a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures. He came to Ephesus, and he was instructed in the way of the Lord, and he was fervent in the Spirit, and he spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he didn't know everything. He only knew the baptism of John. There were two believers there. Hey, they were two believers there. And you know what they did? They didn't publicly embarrass him. But it says that they took him aside and they began to show him the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, we need two people. Did you know if we really did it faithfully, we'd take two people and assign them to every new person? You say, I don't want to get nosy. Well, I don't want you to get nosy. We wouldn't tolerate it but we would get busy about making sure they were instructed. Amen? There's one last point there. Not only is there information and identification and instruction, there's inclusion, participating in the family. You know, we had a lady serving with us Friday at the, at the gathering. Hey, they were 400, almost 4, and 350, 375 senior adults and some young people like me in here. And, and, and man, we had a hoot. Oh, preacher, you don't you're supposed to do that in a Baptist church. Well, we just had a good time. Amen. We had somebody old as dirt like Ed O'Neill and somebody young sprout like that little piano player with that old curly hairdo. And you know what we did? For an hour and a half, we lift up Jesus. Amen. A, a solid hour and a half, they lifted up Jesus. You say, what has that all got to do with this? Because I'm telling you, church, we've got to learn how to take the oldest and the youngest. There's not two or three churches, there's a church. Amen. Inclusion. Notice what it said, and all that believe were together. All that believe were together, and they had all things in common, and they sold their possession. Now, brother, you're talking, you better go to talk to somebody else, and I'm not going to sell my stuff and give to nobody. You've just said he's not Lord of your life. Because if he told you to, you should. But now, he hasn't told me to tell you to do that. But if he tells you to do what he says... But it said these people were so much in, together and had so much in common that they began to sell possessions, part them to all men as every man had need. People who gave their lives to Jesus in those days, they were either killed 
or they were totally marked off by their family. There wasn't Social Security. There wasn't Medicare or Medicaid. There was no other means to be self-sustaining. But brother, they were a part of a group of people called the church. And you know what? They made sure that they, from the newest member to the oldest member, they made sure they were included. Two things about it, and I close. There was caring and sharing. You say, oh, but I care, but I can't share. Brother, you don't care enough. Because if God leads you to share, you better share. Amen? Amen? Oh, I don't have much, preacher, but you don't know what $5 might mean to that other person God told you to share to right. with. But there was also giving and receiving. There's one principle that I'll never get over in the Scripture, and I've, 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 had, it, I've had to learn it the harder way. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Amen. I meet people quite often that tell me they would give if they had it to give. And they're having to receive. And until I had to come on the opposite end one time in a couple of occasions in life that were not real serious, but till we had to receive, I knew little about what that principle meant. One instance, I remember I was pastoring the church in the 80s. And on Friday, January the 13th in 1984, I broke a jaw. A Baptist preacher breaks his jaw. Now, I know some deacons that would like to break it once in a while, but I did. And I laid in a hospital all weekend. All I needed was somebody to wire my mouth together and let me go home. But I had to lay there from Friday till Monday evening late with a hospital gown that made me think I was covered because they was going to do surgery on me that afternoon. I remember one old deacon visited me. He couldn't even drive, so somebody carried him to Brunswick. He visited with me. And the most humiliating thing in my life that had ever happened at that point happened. He handed my wife $20. You say, $20? I took more than that in my front pocket. But a 27-year-old Baptist preacher didn't have $20 in his billfold to give her to buy gas or a hamburger. You know what? God worked through a man. Church, I'll tell you something. I love the church. But to assimilate people in the church, it takes information. It takes identification. You need to feel like you're part of us. Instruction, but also inclusion. You bow your heads all over the building. I didn't mean to get emotional with you today, but I want to tell you something. If you haven't figured it out yet, we need one another. Amen. And some of us need one another worse than others. But I'm going to tell you, if you live long enough, you're going to need us just like we need you. But more than you need us, you need Jesus. I'm going to pray with you, Brother Daniel's going to stand before you in just a moment. Have you not invited Jesus into your heart? Let me beg of you to do that. And as you do that, let me ask you to confess your sin to him privately. Confess your faith in him publicly. And let me ask you, personally become a part of us or a church somewhere of like faith that you can be faithful. Father, bless this group of people. There's nothing good about us save what Jesus has done in us. But God, we need you, and we need them, and we need one another. Bless this invitation now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together all over the building?
be seated. Son and the Holy Ghost. 